Well, good morning. It is a joy and a privilege to be with you here today at First Baptist Geneva. And can we just give the Lord a hand of praise and thanks and gratitude for Aaron, this wonderful team leading us today. God bless each of you. And I know how blessed and fortunate you are to have Pastor Conrad, his wife Gina here leading your church. And I know that we thank God for those shepherds who heed God's call to come and just pour their lives into a, a church, into a family, into a community and have a great burden to shepherd you as God would have him to do. And so would you just join me today in just thanking the Lord for your pastor, for his family and for how they lead you so wonderfully here. And it is a great privilege to come and to share in a time of revival. I know that each of us in our prayers, we, we pray for revival. We ask for God to do something different, for God to do something new, for God to do something fresh within our lives. And quite honestly, uh, we pray that and we're not even sure what that means sometimes. We don't even know what that looks like. Uh, we've all had seasons, moments, occasions where we've seen the uniqueness of God, the hand of God, a, a, a fresh touch of God moving, a fresh wind blowing over his people, but yet to be a part of that sustained, ongoing, undeniable work of God is something that most of us have not ever experienced over an extended period of time. And so we pray that this week will be the beginning of something new, something fresh within each of our lives individually, for revival is about the the church, but it's not just about the church, it's about the people of God. Amen. For the people of God, we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as God moves in our lives and we're able to see God do a great work among his body, among his people. And he did say, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And it'd be my prayer that in 2021 that we could see that verse lived out within the lives of his people and even the life of First Baptist Geneva. So I ask you today to open God's word to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. We're going to read one verse, verse 31. It's a unique opportunity to look in on another church. You know, uh, when I was growing up, we had party lines. Any remember party lines as a kid? Okay, that's now called Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all that. Well, my grandmother, you know, we were on a party line, had about probably six or eight people. I don't know how many folks were on that same connectivity. And my grandmother was a pro at listening in on other people's conversations, you know. But she would never admit it, you know. She would always know everything was going on. We'd say, well, how do you know that? Well, I just know it. Well, we knew she knew it because she was listening to people's conversations over the phone when you pick up the phone. So some of you don't know what party line is. Google it today and you'll be blessed by that, I assure you. And you'll be thankful that it no longer exists. At least we don't think it does anyway uh, within America. But we're able to look in on the life of the early church here in Acts 4.31 to see a unique moment and, and, and an opportunity for us to glean from that church, to learn from the people of God gathering together. This is, this is post-crucifixion. This is post-resurrection. This is post-ascension. This is the beginning of the church, the body of Christ. We, we connect back to these people. We're a part of what they are experiencing, the same Lord, the same Holy Spirit, the same salvation, the same gathering of God's people that they are experiencing this moment is what we are experiencing even here today. And so I invite you to open the word of God to Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And if you're able, would you stand in honor of God's precious word, Acts 4, 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. This is a moment that became a movement. This is a season of repentance that ushered in revival. This is a time of confession in the early church that brought about a cleansing that only the Lord can do within our lives. It would be my prayer that we would say, Lord, do it again. Amen. May God bless his precious word. You may be seated. I was in seminary serving a church in Mississippi, a rural church, and uh, I would travel down to New Orleans where I was going through my MDiv and my PhD work, and I would commute back and forth. And we lived in this little community that really nobody ever moved into. As a matter of fact, most of the young people, when they reached the time to go away to school or go away to some kind of technical training, they would leave and literally never return except to visit their parents. And so it was not a growing community. It was not a thriving community, but it was just a community that seemed to always exist. I mean, I don't know how, but it just perpetuated itself. 
itself over time. And so one day as I was coming back from New Orleans, I was traveling along I-10. I got off at the Franklin Creek Road exit where our church was located, and I was behind a U-Haul moving truck. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, is this somebody moving out or is it somebody moving in? Usually they were always moving out. And so I stalked the moving truck. I just stayed behind it and followed to see where it was going to go. And sure enough, it turned into our little community there and it pulled into a home that had been, had been for sale for quite a period of time. And the individual was, was had apparently bought the home. And so this was on a Friday afternoon. And so I made my way onto my house and I told Karen, my wife, I said, man, I'm so excited. It looks like we got a new family moving into our community. I'm going to get out there in the morning and visit them, be the first church to get there to welcome them to our community. And so I did on Saturday, I went by and I visited the people who had moved in. But what I found out, though, that it was a, a man who was, who was a widower. His wife had passed away about six months prior to that, and he was just trying to get a fresh start, kind of a new beginning and start over again. He was just looking for a new place to be, so to speak, and he found this property, and, and he bought it. And so he moved into the community. And so I invited him to church, and, and I you know, told him about everything. We talked about his relationship with Christ. He said he was a believer. Matter of fact, he'd been very active in the church he was a member of prior to coming out to our community. And so I said, well, man, we'd love to have you come to church in the morning. I kind of told him where it was, although it wasn't very hard to find in the community, but, but he said, I'll be there. Well, we've all had people say, I'll be there many times over the years, but sure enough, on Sunday morning, he showed up. I mean, I'm, a, I'm almost ready to become Pentecostal, to be honest. I mean, you know, <laughs> somebody actually said they're going to come, and they came to church on that day. But I had no idea the firestorm that I had just set off in that rural church in Mississippi, because this was the first black man who had ever walked into the doors of that church. So the service went on. I got home, and as soon as I got home, my phone was already ringing. And I was invited to a deacon's meeting that afternoon uh, and, and said, we've got something that we need to discuss. Well, all afternoon, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just torn up. I mean, I, I, I knew that this could go one or two ways. I wasn't really sure exactly what all was going to happen in this meeting. And so I went to the meeting, and uh, Karen and I had already talked about it. I had already said, if, if that gentleman isn't welcome in the church, we're not welcome in the church. And, and if they're not willing to receive him, then, then we'll just walk away and we'll find something else because God doesn't desire for us to have that kind of attitude toward anyone who lives in our communities. And so... So I went into the meeting and, 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 the, and the conversation started and one of the, one of the, the deacons said something and, uh, and then I remember Archie Hamilton. Mr. Archie Hamilton worked for the International Paper Company and he was a tall guy. He stood about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, but he was very quiet, very gentle in, in, in his demeanor. But he, but he just stood up and he said, I want you to know I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed that we're having this meeting today. He said, our pastor went out yesterday and visited with someone in our community, invited him to come to church. We ought to be celebrating the fact that that man was here today in church. And he said, and I want you to know he'll be back next Sunday. He said, because I'm going to go by and pick him up and he'll personally come with me. And he'll be seated right beside me. And if any of you have a problem with that, you don't say a word to the pastor. You come and talk to me. Well, I want to tell you, I was high-fiving myself behind my back. I mean, you know, I'm just like, you go, Archie Hamilton. And I want to tell you, God took that man, a man who was willing to stand for truth, a man who was willing to stand for the gospel, and he changed the heart of that church because there was repentance that took place as a result of that. And Mr. Hamilton made a very bold statement, one that, I, you know, I've been, I've been around church all of my life, and, and, and I've never seen anyone in a moment make a statement that was so profound and so true that should mark everything that we do as the people of God. He said, the gospel of Jesus Christ brings us together. Amen. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings us together. You see, the early church understood this in these incipient stages. They, they understood what it meant to be together. They understood the Hebrews 10 passage, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And the word that is used there for together in verse 31 is the word sunago. It's a derivative of the word synagogue from the Old Testament. And it means to gather together physically and, and spiritually. You see, there's just something that happens when we're in the room together. There's just something that only God can do when God's people come together. 
And we're here because of the gospel. We're not here because we just happen to live in the same geographic location. We're not just here because we're family and friends. We're here because of the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ the Lord, that has redeemed us from our sin. He has transformed our life. He has given us a different trajectory. And everything about who we are now is defined by our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when they came together, they were together physically in the room, but more important, they were together spiritually. And everything that they did was defined and marked by the Lord Jesus Christ, his will, his way, his word, and the, and the preeminence of that in every area, in every facet of their life. If there's one thing that the pandemic has done among many, but if there's one thing that it has done to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it has hurt us because we have not been together. We've not been together. And what we see now is that the, the, the conversation is marked by social media. And the conversation is marked by the national news. And we get so amped up and revved up about everything that we hear when all of that can be changed if only God's people come together and the Holy Spirit of God knits our hearts together and we say, not my will, but thy will be done, O Lord. Coming together together in the Lord Jesus Christ. Gathering together in a physical place, though, does not grant, nor does it even guarantee entitlement to the spiritual power and the presence of God. Right. Now, what I'm about to say may be shocking to you. It may be even, uh, even offensive to some. But there are 900 Southern Baptist churches that close their doors every year. 900. There are churches that are meeting today and they're making a decision. Are we even going to come back next week? 900. We talk about church planting. Oh, yes. We need vibrant, vital, gospel-centered, gospel-focused churches planted all across the United States of America because we need people coming together to focus on the commission and the command that God has given us to reach a lost and a dying world. At the same time, there are over 1,000 ministers who leave the ministry every month across denominational lines. Now, some of that is because of moral failure, but often it's just because of the pressures, the stressors, and all that comes against them, and they're just so overwhelmed, they just simply can't bear the weight and the burden that it places upon them and upon their family anymore. You see, place is important. Place is important. And we come into this place, we need to be reminded that God can do more in a moment than we can do in a lifetime. God can do more in this place, in this moment, when we come together than we could either fathom or, or even, and even design in our own mind or in our own desires of our life. It's much like the psalmist would say in Psalm 133. He said, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like oil poured upon the head, running down upon the beard, flowing down upon the garment, off the hem of the garment. And, and, and it's the power and the presence of God. It is good and it is pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so as we read this scripture today, the early church understood together. Now if you read verse 31, the beauty of this scripture is they. It's just they. No names needed. Nobody's more important than anyone else. Everybody has a role. Everybody has a function. I love what the pastor said earlier. If you're here, you've got something you need to be doing. It's just they. We're, we're all in this together, fully yielded, fully surrendered. It's Christ and it's Christ alone. And out of this moment, God launches a movement. Amen. May that be the prayer for this revival. May that be the prayer above all things for what we are desiring to see God do in our midst this week. And I thank you. I've gotten cards from you every day for the last month or two. I'm going to miss them. I mean, when, when the revival's over, quite honestly, because I've been covered in prayer. I mean, and it's not just about this revival. It, it's been covered in prayer and all other things of my life. I mean, what a blessing it is. And we see that in this text because they came together in prayer. Notice what it says there in verse 31. And when they had prayed, prayed. 
Now, the word for prayer here, as you know, there are many different words for prayer in the Greek language, but the word for prayer here is the word that means urgency, desperation. It's just begging and pleading before God. Now, we pray. We'll pray, Lord, bless the missionaries. Lord, bless this food. Lord, bless our families. Lord, bless this, bless that. But, but this is a whole different level of praying. This is coming before the Lord and realizing, God, if you don't show up and if you don't do something, Lord, then there's really nothing that's going to happen. Lord, outside of what you can do in this place, we're just spinning our wheels and wasting our time. It's just crying out to God, God, we need you. God, move among us. And whatever it means to me personally, Lord, I am willing to do in order to be a part of what you desire to do in the advance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. When was the last time that you prayed desperately? Just praying and pouring out your heart, broken before God, overwhelmed, I don't have the answer. I can't figure it out. No one else can really give me the answer. Only God, only God can do something in this moment within my life. They prayed in that way. And I love the sequencing of this verse. They prayed. The place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were filled and they spoke the word of God with boldness. I think it's, it's important for us to understand that prayer began this all. Prayer started everything here. Many times we do everything else and we say, in the end, God, we pray you'll bless this. God, you'll take this. But they just said, God, we don't even know what to do until we pray. God, we don't know what to say until we pray. We don't know where we're headed until we pray. They just came and before any word was said, before any note was played, before any scripture was read, before anything was said, they just fell on their faces before God unashamed and they cried out in prayer, in desperation for God to move, for God to move among their lives. Have you ever had anyone pray over you? And there's no greater blessing to have people praying over your life. Amen. No greater blessing to know that someone cares enough about you that they'll call your name before Almighty God. Amen. See, some of you are here today because somebody's praying for you. A husband praying for a wife or a wife praying for a husband. Parents praying for children. Brothers praying for sisters, sisters for brothers. Yeah, prayer. So important. I am a product of prayer. I know that. I had two grandmothers that prayed over my life. I had Christian parents, godly people, and, and, and they loved us and they, they brought us up in the ways of the Lord. And I know how fortunate I am to, be, to have been reared in a Christian home. I understand that when I talk to people who have not been. But I had two grandmothers that just prayed over my life. One of my grandmothers lived just about 100 yards away from the home that we grew up in in North Alabama. And so when I would get home in the afternoon from school on that yellow school bus, I'd jump off and I had to stay with her while my parents were, were still at work. They didn't trust me to be in the house by myself, and rightly so. And so, <laughs> so I would go and stay with my grandmother. And, and, and as I would get off the school bus, I'd go running up, and, and about the time I'd get to that, that bottom area before you'd hit the steps to go up on her porch, I'd, I'd, I'd take a big inhale because she loved to cook. I mean, she was wonderful. And she cooked the best little, she called them tea cakes, just like sugar cookies. Those things, man, they would almost melt before you put them to your mouth. That's how good they were. And, and when I got there, I could smell them. And, 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 and if she'd been cooking, she had me. I'd do anything she needed me to do before, so I could get to those cookies. And so I'd get inside, and she'd say, have you got any homework? Yes, ma'am, I do. Do your homework. I was the best homework doer in America. I want to tell you that. <laughs> I could get that homework knocked out just like that to get to those cookies. And then, then she'd, she'd set them on the table. I mean, she just had a plan in this. She'd set those cookies on the table right there in front of you, you know. And then she would sit down on the couch beside me. And this went on the time I was in the first grade, third grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. Every afternoon, she would open up the Bible, and she'd read the Bible to me. And I'd listen to anything to get to the cookies. <laughs> but she was hiding the word of God in my heart. Amen. Then my grandmother would take those little 
short fingers of hers and, and she would put them on my shoulders and she would pray for me. She, she prayed that I would grow up and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. She prayed that I would be a man that God would use. I mean, I, mean, I, can, I can still remember the words that she said over those years as she prayed over my life. Now, my other grandmother, she was a happy prayer. I mean, she would sing and shout. And she'd just get all carried away. I mean, it wasn't nothing calm about her, I want to tell you. And so you go visit her, and she had this chair she sat in, had these two overstuffed, you know, armrests. And she'd say, oh, honey, sit right here on this armrest. So you, you'd sit down there. And she'd just start shouting and singing and praying, quoting scripture, and then she'd want to pray for you. And, and when she prayed for you, I don't know why mothers and grandmothers like to do this. She'd grab your cheeks, you know, you know. <laughs> You ever, had your, you ever had your cheeks grabbed like that? And she'd just pull them, you know, right up in front of the face right here. Now, I grew up in North Alabama, so you got to give us a little bit of latitude here. Um, this <laughs> grandmother dipped snuff. <laughs> Any of your grandmothers in here dipped snuff? Don't be embarrassed by it. I mean, that's just what it is. I mean, you know. And I remember when she grabbed my cheek, she'd get about right here, and I'd be thinking, Lord, let her say it and not spray it, you know, <laughs> over these next few moments, you know. And she would just start pouring out her heart in prayer. She'd just weep, weep, as she would pray for me. Now, both of my grandmas are in heaven today, and I don't know what all they know and don't know. I haven't been there yet. I'm going, but I haven't been there yet. I don't understand all the dynamics of that, but I hope that in some ways, that they know that their prayers did not go unheeded, Amen. that their prayers didn't go unanswered. You see, you never know what desperate prayer can do. Don't quit praying. Don't give up. God can do things through our prayers. God will move through our prayers. God will show up in our prayers. Don't quit praying. They were together in prayer. But it also says in the scripture that they were together in presence. For it says, after they prayed, the place, we talked about that, where they were assembled together, here they are in the room, it was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I love the shaken and filled here. And we, we all want to be filled, we don't like being shaken. You know, Lord, use me, Lord, bless me, but I don't, I don't like this part of it. <laughs> Can we just kind of skip over the chastisement and some of the, you know, the, the discipline? I mean, you know, we want to be filled. We don't like the shaken part of this at all. But they were shaken and they were filled. I, I, isn't that what this revival is all about? Shaken to be filled? Shaken to be filled? I mean, we should desire that. That's not a bad thing. It should, be, it should be the most, the most consecrated thing that we pray today before God. Lord, shake me that I can be filled with your spirit in the way that you desire for my life to live for you. Now, let, let's think about what those words mean. Shaken. It means to be unsettled. It means to be stirred. It means to be afflicted. It means to be burdened. Because God needs to break some things off of our life before we're going to be fit to be used for him. That's right. God's going to unsettle us about things that are in our heart. Maybe no one else is even aware of. No one else has any idea that this is a part of your life and who you are. The private things, the secretive things, the thoughts, the actions, the words. And God is shaking those things. And until we're willing to be honest about them... <laughs> we're not going to experience revival. We can lie to man, we can fool man, but you can't fool God. God knows your heart. He knows everything about your life. He even knows the number of hairs on your head, and that's much easier on my head to count, I want to tell you. But, but he's fully aware of that. He knows everything about your life, everything about your life. And, and, and when we come for revival, I think that's the reason we're not having revival today is because we don't want to confront our own sinfulness. We don't want to confront our own disobedience. We don't want to be confronted by our own unfaithfulness unto God. But we should come in this room today and say, Lord, above everything else, shake me in order that I can be filled with your Holy Spirit to be used as a vessel in your kingdom's work. Now, what is God seeking to break off your life today? 
What is there? That until you deal with this, you're not going to experience what God desires you to experience through this revival. They were shaken. You almost visually think that it's almost like the room was moving. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you just couldn't deny the, the, the profound presence of God and the moving of God. Man didn't manipulate this. Man wasn't managing this. They were praying. And as they prayed in brokenness, God began shaking things in their heart and in their life that they had to deal with in order to be where God needed and wanted them to be as his followers and as his church. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Just an unhindered fellowship. Now let's be clear on theology here. Let's don't get all messed up. You receive the Holy Spirit of God when you're saved. You receive it in totality. It's not a later thing and a post later thing. You receive all the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you receive eternal life when you are saved. Eternal life doesn't begin when you get to heaven. Eternal life begins when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior within your life. And you receive the Holy Spirit of God. But yet we fully understand because we've experienced it. We can quench. We can hinder. We can stifle. We can be unresponsive to the Spirit of God. And so what they are dealing with here is the fact that there are things in their life that keep them from being obedient, sold out, all in with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as they were praying, God, by his spirit, is searching their heart and revealing to them the things that need to be revealed, and they are repenting of that and confessing that so that there can be that right relationship with God, that unhindered fellowship with the Lord. Well, I want to tell you, this is real. That's right. you know, th th this isn't just some theoretical postulate, some, some idea. No, no, this is real. Th th this is my life. This is your life. This is where we all must be before Almighty God. In 1996, I moved to Florida, become the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Brandon, Florida, beside Tampa. Brandon is a growing community. It's just incredible, you know, the, the people that are there. Within 10-mile loop of our church, there were something like 600,000 people who were there. And, and God brought us to this church. And so when we got there, I followed a guy who, who, was, who was a dear friend. I mean, a wonderful man. He was not a problem. He was very supportive. But he'd been there for about 25 years. And, um, and, and he had a way of doing things, and we had a way of kind of where we felt like God needed to move the church to go forward. And, and, and so here you have the people and they're kind of caught in the midst of this, you know, loyal to him, wanting to love the new pastor, but, you know, set in ways, status quo, but not sure about direction and what we need to do. If we, are we going to reach these people or not? We haven't reached them in the last 20 years, so maybe, maybe we need to try something different, you know, if we're, going to, if we're going to have a shot at reaching the young people and the, and the young adults and young families all around the community. And, and so, you know, God was, God was working. I mean, we were having people saved almost every Sunday. I mean, it was wonderful to see but there was just something that was there. I mean, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. I mean, it just seemed like no matter, no matter how many steps we go forward, something would just hit us and knock us back. And we, we just never could seem to come together as a church. We just seemed to always have something that, that was just holding us back from just seeing God let us go and God being let loose within the church itself. And so I, I, uh, after about six or eight months of being there, I called a, a group of people to come together. Uh, we met on a Thursday night, and uh, I, I, I sat them down. We sat in a room together. These are people that are indicative of the church, you know, age-wise and everything else. And, and so I just, you know, kind of began sharing my heart and some of my, my concerns. And I said, you know, I, I, I said, if I'm sensing this, you've got to be sensing this. It just seems like, you know, we, we can't seem to come together here. We, you know, we're seeing God work, but yet there just isn't a joy. There isn't a unity. There isn't, there isn't just a, a zeal to, to push on and to push ahead in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I said, you know, I just need your help. I need you to, I need you to talk to me. Well, you know, we start getting, oh, pastor, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. You just keep doing what you're doing. You know, everything's good. We're all okay, you know, and on and on. And then finally, this guy goes, <clears throat> Anytime anybody goes <clears throat> in a meeting, <laughs> get ready, because on the other side, the <clears throat> is going to be what you want to hear, but may not, may not want to hear. And so he spoke up, and he said, well, he said, Pastor, he said, he said, you've asked, and I'll tell you. 
He said, every Sunday that you get up there and preach, he said, you're always calling people to be saved. And he said, and you give an invitation and people are coming forward. He said, but pastor, he said, he said, you know, we're just not that kind of church. He said, he said, you know, we, that, that's just not who we are. And he said, and I want to tell you, you've got people that have left the church because of it. And, and, and you've got people that are going to leave the church because of it. And he said, if you don't stop doing it, you're going to be leaving the church because of it. Well, what do you say to that? I mean, I, I'm just stunned, really. And so, so I looked at it, and this is what I said. I said, well, first of all, I'm answerable to God and God alone. And God called me to preach the gospel. And if you preach the gospel, men, women, boys, and girls are going to be saved. I said, so I would be derelict in, in what God had called me to do if I didn't continue preaching and calling people to salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm stunned that you said this tonight, but it helps me understand you know, really where we are here. And, uh, and I said, you know, I, I just want you to know, you know, if I, I'm not going to change because this is who God's called me to be. And if I need to quietly walk away, I will. Uh, but I pray that God's going to change the heart of the church. And we sang Kumbaya and we left the room, you know. So I got home and I, I said to Karen, I said, babe, I said, you still have the name of that moving company. We may be needing them pretty soon here. I'm not really sure what's about to happen. So, so, you know, Sunday goes on, next Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday. And I just, I mean, I probably doubled down, to be honest. I mean, you know, man, I'm just, I, I'm just more focused than I've ever been before, you know, on sharing the gospel and calling people to salvation. We're seeing people saved every week. And, and the, and the, unique thing about this is that this guy never stayed for the invitation. You know, as soon as we get to that point, he'd always leave. He's sat in the back so that when the music would start, he'd just walk out. And God held my tongue that night because I wanted to say to him, then how do you even know what we do in invitation? You don't even stay for it. How do you, how do you know what God is doing during the invitation time? But I didn't, and I'm grateful for that. And so we go on a few months here, and uh, things are not changing, but, you know, it's, it's just that constant tension that's there. And finally, on a Sunday morning, he stayed for an invitation. And I'm like, oh my, this is interesting because I'm standing here at the front and he didn't leave. And then when the music started, he started walking forward. And, and, and the, what went through my mind was this, I've never been fired from a Southern Baptist church. <laughs> but this guy is about to come up and say, that's the last invitation you're going to ever do here and I'm going to be fired right here. He made his way down. And, and, and to give you just a little bit of context around, this, this is, I mean, this, is a, this man was a, was a deacon. He was a Sunday school teacher. I mean, he was a, like a multimillionaire. I mean, you know, he was just generous in everything. And, and, and to hear him say that, it was just, just so just, just stunning, I want to tell you. And when he got in front of me, I was ready for whatever he was going to say. And when he got there, his hands were just shaking. I took hold of them, and then he tried to talk, and he couldn't. He, 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 he was so emotional, he just couldn't say anything. Finally, he got enough composure that he said, Pastor, do you remember that meeting a few months ago? And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, you remember what I said? And I said, yes, sir, I remember it well. He said, well, I want you to know the problem has never been with you. The problem is not with the church. The problem is with me. Because every Sunday that you call people to be saved, I'm the one that needed to come and give his life to Christ. And he says, so I'm here today to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, my goodness. We knelt down at that altar. I think people may have thought we were down in wrestling. I don't know what they thought, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and he just poured his heart out into the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man was radically saved. I want to tell you, and God used one man to change the heart of a church. Amen. If you were to take the, the principle of the jar and the lid, it was as if in that moment God just took the lid off of that church. And for the next almost 20 years, we just had continual revival Amen. because God moved and God blessed I mean, I'm talking about moving from a congregation of six, seven, eight hundred people on Sunday morning to over twenty-two to twenty-five hundred on Sunday. I mean, it was just—it was just—it was just magnificent how God just just moved because what what one man had to get right in his heart with God, he was holding back everything that God desired to do. But when he got right, 
everything changed. You see, that's shaken and filled. Maybe that's where you are today. You may be that one. You may be the one standing in the way of God working and God moving. You may be the one. Oh, not me. Oh, listen to what the Lord is saying, what the Spirit is saying into your heart. They're also to gather in purpose. And the last part of this verse is powerful. As a result of all these things, they did what? They spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, we want to be bold in our witness, but we don't necessarily want to go through those other things that are in this verse. There is that sequence, as we said earlier. They prayed. They were assembled together. They were shaken. They were filled. And the end result of that is that they could not help. They could not help but declare the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ because the gospel brings us together. And if you do not believe that, that, that in Christ you can change the world from where you are, then you will not in Christ change the world where you are planted. I want to tell you, this past week has been just a, a, a magnificent week of, of ministry in our life. On, on, on Tuesday and Wednesday, I had the joy of being with 135 church planters here in the state of Florida. Hear what I said, 135 church planters here in the state of Florida. Multilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-generational. I mean, a very diverse group of individuals planting churches from the panhandle all the way down to the Keys. And, 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 and they, they, they believe in what God can do and they're speaking the word of God with boldness. For if you want to see and check up on this church and, and these people and what they're doing from Acts 4.31 to Acts 17 verse 6, just a few chapters later, it says that these very people, the theys that are in this room, that the ones who have turned the world upside down have come here also. One generation, one group of people, one church united in the gospel in approximately 30 30 years change the world Amen. with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. What would be the descriptive for you or a First Baptist Geneva today? If that, if that last phrase was written about this, this morning, and they spoke the word of God with, what would be the next word that would go there for your life or for the church's life? Fear, hesitation, Reservation? No. They spoke the word of God with boldness. They were plain. They were clear. They, 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 they did it with great conviction. And, and we're at that pivotal moment. Let's not think that the early church was, 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 was entered into a culture that readily received them and a culture that, that embraced them and a culture that was easy for them to minister within. No, this is a culture that if they spoke the name of Jesus Christ, they were risking their life. And many of them were martyred for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there was a price and there was a cost that came with speaking the word of God with boldness. And in our culture today, we are at a pivotal moment. We're moving past a pandemic. We have a huge cultural divide. And churches are going to come out of this one way or another. They're going to come out as a placeholder or a stakeholder. A placeholder or a stakeholder. And that's very different. A placeholder church is inwardly focused. A stakeholder church is outwardly focused. A placeholder church is focused on strife. A stakeholder church is focused on salvation. A placeholder church is consumed with budget and buildings. But a placeholder, a stakeholder church is consumed with mission and ministry. A placeholder church has a spirit of chaos, a spirit of chaos. But a stakeholder church has a spirit of celebration. Placeholder churches are lifeless, but stakeholder churches are lively. Placeholder churches are escaping the culture, but stakeholder churches are engaging the culture. Placeholder churches are lifting up their hands in resignation and defeat, but stakeholder churches are lifting their hands in rejoicing and declaration. Placeholder churches are grumbling and griping, but stakeholder churches 
churches are gaining and growing. Placeholder churches are giving up and giving out, but stakeholder churches are giving more and giving all. Placeholder churches are consumed with retaining, but stakeholder churches are, receive, are consumed with releasing. Placeholder churches are marked by jealousy, but stakeholder churches are marked by joy. Placeholder churches are maintaining. Stakeholder churches are ministry. Placeholder churches are infighting, and stakeholder churches are not fighting. Placeholder churches are defending the status quo, but stakeholder churches are declaring with all of their heart, let's go to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we will make that decision. This revival may be the moment that First Baptist Geneva decides, are we going to be a placeholder or a stakeholder? A placeholder or a stakeholder? So can we come together today? Can we come to this altar today in a moment that can become a movement? In a moment where we can say, Lord, shake us that we can be filled. Shake us that we can be filled. And we come together praying to be filled that we can be bold to turn the world upside down. For the gospel in this setting and the gospel in our setting demands everything of my life and of your life. And together, we can change the world through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning, you may be that one standing in the way. Maybe you've been in church, but not in Christ. And there's a big difference between the two. Maybe you have everyone in this room full, but yet you know in your heart you don't have that relationship with Christ. And today is a day of salvation for you. Now is the acceptable time of the Lord. This is the moment that God has prepared for you. I mean, just think about that. He, he, he cares so much about you that, that over two years ago, a revival was prayed about and planned and put on a calendar and, and God knew exactly who was gonna be in the room on this day. And by his spirit today, he is calling you unto his great salvation. Someone invited you to come. Someone may have picked you up and brought you. Maybe you just saw an advertisement and showed up. However you got here, it's not by accident. God has a design and a plan for your life. Amen. And he today wants to redeem you unto himself. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, Pastor Conrad will be here this morning. If you'll come and say, Pastor, today I need to get my life right with the Lord. I'm just tired of playing these games. I'm tired of the brokenness. I'm tired of everything that's in my life and I need to be right today with Christ. I, I need to experience what only the Lord can do within my life and I want to surrender everything of myself to him. And you come today and experience the salvation that is only found in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. To the church today, is this not what we all desire? I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't, would not we desire that, that, that if someone were writing a descriptive of First Baptist Geneva, that it could be like an Acts 40, 431 moment, that when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness, just boldness. And so this morning our altar is open and I pray that you'll come. We, we, need, we need you to come today. It's not, it's not to, so we can talk about how many people came forward. Not at all. But, but, but there's just that, that movement that encourages people to respond. That, that, that the boldness that you show can make a great impact on the lives of others. And so if God is speaking to your heart, don't quench. Don't hinder. Don't, don't stifle. Don't stop what he desires to do. Instead, just move as God would call you to move. And we'll see what he'll do with the they. <laughs> that's in this room assembled together. It may be there's just things you need to confess, things you need to repent. It may be that there's things among people in this room that need to be made right today. You know, maybe, maybe there's just animosity between you and someone else. Maybe there's hurt feelings, there's harsh words, there's division that you've just chosen to ignore, but you know today you can no longer ignore it if we're gonna be a church together in Christ. If that's what God is asking of you, then you make that right today in him.
Let's stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of this moment that you are with us and that your spirit today is calling us unto your salvation and unto a right relationship with you. Lord, I know that it's, it's always a, a challenging moment because eternity is weighing in the balance in the hearts of many right now. And, and Lord, they can, can I... I just don't know if I can walk forward. I don't know if I can come. And, and Lord, we know that the walking forward is not what saves us, but, but it is taking those steps of saying, I want to give everything to Christ. I want to, I want to move away from the old person to the new person I can be in the Lord. I, I need someone to talk with me about what it means to have that personal relationship with Christ. And I pray, Lord, today that there will be young men and young women, there will be adults who are here today, Lord, who will come and say, I need Jesus. I've, I, I know if I were to breathe my last right now, that I, I would not spend an eternity with the Lord in heaven, but I'd be separated from him. And I, I, need, I need to make it right. I, I, I just need to make it right. And Lord, we know that, that there'd have to be nothing but love and joy and receptivity. No one would be critical. No one would be judgmental. Lord, we would just rejoice in the salvation of anyone here today that would say yes to you. Father, for the church today, we have put the word revival before us, we, we, we're here today because we say this is the start of revival. But we know, Lord, that we can go through every one of these meetings and not experience revival because revival is of the heart. It's my life, your life, it's our lives together. Lord, just being open before you and hearing what your spirit is saying. And may we respond today, Lord, I pray that the people of God would come to this altar today and the Lord just say, shake me, shake me, shake me, break off whatever you need to break off my life today, Lord. I repent, I confess, Lord, I come before you, Lord. I need what only you can do to change my life today in a right relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, that we'll move this altar today. If the altar is filled, we'll take these front pews and make that an altar, Lord. Whatever, whatever we need to do, Lord, we, we just give this time to you. May it be to your glory and to that alone we pray this in Jesus' name.